Welcome to our uh, evening lecture. Uh, this is my honor to introduce uh, Barbara Tönkis Pleva. She is a professor of Eastern and Central European Studies and head of the Center for European Studies at Lund University in Sweden. And as I heard a couple of uh, uh, minutes ago, she's also the dean of, uh, of uh, the social science, the researchers uh, at the same university. Um, her main uh, research interests are cultural memory, heritage, identity, and nationalism in Eastern and Central Europe. But she has also published on Polish, Swedish, cultural relations. Um, she had participated in many international research projects, and most recently, she was the leader of the European Research Network in search for transcultural memory in Europe. Uh, and her international experience also includes visiting fellowships at universities in Berkeley, Stanford, and uh, Tokyo. In 2015, uh, uh, she received the uh, Medal Pro Meritis, which is a medal of the Royal Swedish, Acad Swedish Academy of Science. Uh, she is also the editor and author of, now, now of, of a number of books and articles in English, Swedish, and Polish as well uh, the edit uh, as the editor-in-chief of Slavica Lundensia. Her latest publications uh, include uh, The 20th Century in European Memory uh, in 2017, Disputed Memory, Emotions and Memory Politics in Central, Eastern and South Eastern Europe, 2016, and last but not least, Whose Memory, Which Future, Remembering Ethnic Cleansing and Lost Cultural Diversity in Eastern, Central, and Southern, so, uh, Southeastern Europe uh, in 2016. So, Barbara, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm really proud to be here uh, at this special place uh, to be invited by Simone Wiesenthal Center. Uh, and of course, um, uh, in uh, some terms, I will speak today about uh, Holocaust, but since I am not historian, uh, I will not give you a historical perspective on it, but rather a, a, a perspective from cultural studies point of view, since uh, I represent this discipline, uh, cultural studies. Or maybe rather I would describe myself as uh, with a kind of neology, neologism and calling myself a mnemologist. <laughs> it means a researcher within a multidisciplinary uh, and interdisciplinary field called memory studies. Uh, this uh, um, field developed, uh, have, has developed very dynamically uh, last 20 years or so, but uh, uh, it has much more deeper roots, uh, actually starting with some founding fathers uh, uh, and uh, Maurice Halbwax, I would call as, as a main founding father of, of uh, research on memory. Then I mentioned some few like Frederick Bartlett, uh, social psychologist, Paul Rico, philosopher, Pierre Nora, historian, Jan Asman, archaeologist, and Aleida Asman, uh, a researcher in literary studies. I show them just to, to, to demonstrate for you how multidisciplinary this uh, field is. Uh, and I'm uh, uh, both me and uh, these scholars were not primarily interested in, in memory as a neurological or psychological phenomenon, but first and foremost in a, a memory as a social phenomenon, social memory, or I would rather to call it as, uh, uh, or I use very often the term collective memory. Uh, the de definition of this phenomenon, collective memory, uh, is uh, still not stable, I would say. We uh, still argue how we define uh, collective memory. Uh, some even question the term, but uh, um, I would uh, propose to agree around the definition which uh, is put here, where uh, I uh, uh, define collective memory as the representation of the past, 
both that, share, that are shared by a group and which are collectively commemorated. Uh, but it's not about any memory. It's about memory that enact and give substance to the group's identity, its present conditions, and its vision of the future. So the point I want to make here is that it's, interested, uh, it's interesting to discuss collective memory because it's very much about identity. We can't uh, speak about um, any identity, I would say, without without the past, without relating to the past. When we uh, uh, form uh, our memory, actually both as, as persons and groups, we uh, define ourselves first and foremost in relation to the others, who am I in relation to the others, but as we also define ask uh, our question, who am I in relation who I was yesterday, what, what I came from. So uh, it's about both, I would say, persons and groups that memory has this identity uh, index. So I want you to, to remember this when I, when I will discuss uh, uh, transnational memory. Uh, and uh, the interest for collective memories, uh, the scholarly interest has been uh, with us, as I said, uh, about 15, 20 years. But the interesting thing is that scholars mostly focused on uh, national memories, seeing uh, nations as a kind of container uh, uh, of memories. Uh, but this uh, started to be criticized uh, last 10 years, uh, when, um, with, with the point that, we, that uh, this focus on national memories is a kind of methodological nationalism, as Ulrich Beck uh, called it. And we have started to, to realize that, uh, that people share memories also across the borders, across state borders, national borders, but also ac across cultural borders, across cultures. And this is, in a, in a way, not, nothing new, because, uh, if, I mean, people always uh, shared this uh, through, uh, across, across the borders of every kind. I mean, our, for example, our classical myths like Odysseus myth, or just to give one example, always has been shared across the cultures. But the difference is today that uh, this, this uh, movement uh, between the cultures uh, is very much intensified due to uh, new technologies, digital communication, but also uh, big mobility um, of people. So we have this a kind of uh, time-space compression uh, in, in uh, our uh, cultural development uh, last uh, decades that this, this transnational uh, movement of memory, memories becomes very uh, intensively visible. And it's why there is a need uh, to understand them better and to, to, to pay attention what happened, how the, the memory travel across national borders, how they are me mediated, and what happens in this transfer, how they are received beyond the communities that produce them. So it, it is this aspect that has interested me uh, for, for some time. Uh, and um, then we can, at the end of my lecture, discuss maybe the, the difference between trans, uh, if there is any difference between transnational and transcultural memory, but uh, I hopefully come back later to this. So let's speak about transnational memories and about the Holocaust, because actually uh, already uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, two uh, prominent uh, scholars in sociology, Daniel Levy and Nathan Schneider, proposed that if we speak about transnational memories, it is actually the Holocaust memory which is the one of the first fully fledged transnational collective memories. Because, as they argue, uh, it underpins global concern for uh, human uh, rights. So, uh, around 2016, after this, this, this uh, very influential uh, first uh, article and late, uh, later a book by Levy and Schneider, 
a lot of scholars started to, to look how transnational uh, Holocaust memory is. But most of them focused on uh, mnemonic products, on films and books that are shared across the culture, uh, and um, pictures, photographs, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, while uh, um, I, in my, in my uh, research, I decided to look at some specific places uh, in uh, Europe, specific geographical places, and show uh, practices of memory uh, uh, that could be seen as national or local, but in fact, uh, uh, we can discover that there is very strong transnational dimension uh, 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 behind uh, these pra memory practices around Holocaust. So I want to, to present you two examples uh, uh, from two countries I have worked with. It's from Sweden and Poland because uh, it's, uh, uh, both countries are, are close to my heart since I have uh, I, uh, my origin in Poland, but I moved to Sweden in 1981. So uh, Sweden is actually my second home country. Uh, so I want to, to present uh, these two uh, examples from these two countries that are very different in relation to Holocaust, of course, because Sweden uh, kept, managed to stay uh, outside uh, the Second World War, uh, being uh, declared to, to, to be a neutral uh, country, while Poland, of course, was one of the uh, central uh, arenas of, of the Holocaust where uh, uh, many of the atrocities uh, took place uh, uh, with Auschwitz as a symbol of, of them. So they are very different, but at the same time, there is a, 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 at least, I would say, one commonality, uh, and it is that in both countries, uh, Holocaust uh, memory was very much uh, marginalized uh, until uh, na uh, end of 80s, especially until 1990s, uh, I would say. So there is this history of uh, revival of this memory uh, in the last decades. And uh, my uh, thesis in my lecture is that behind this revival, there are, of course, many factors, but one is this transnational memory workings, as, as uh, I call them. So let me go to the Swedish examples. Uh, here you, you see a picture uh, presenting the Holocaust memorial in Stockholm. Uh, the picture is not the best because it's very difficult to photograph this place since the memorial is uh, 42 uh, meter long and it's placed along a very small alley uh, in the uh, uh, middle of Stockholm so it's very difficult to take picture from from the from the perspective um, uh, but you get hopefully some idea about this this memorial uh, was unveiled in 1998 and initiated by the Swedish Association of Holocaust uh, survivors Actually, um, uh, as you know, uh, um, probably uh, Sweden, uh, uh, they, they were, they were a, a few thousands of Holocaust survivors that, that came to Sweden immediately after at the end of the war through the uh, Bernadotte transports, for example, <coughs> especially women from Ravensbrück. But uh, then there were a few waves of Holocaust survivors coming uh, for example, from Poland uh, in connection to, to uh, the anti-Semitic campaign in 1968, for example, and before even in 1956. So there is a, 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 a quite a strong group uh, of the people who are now, of course, most of them are dead, but still they were uh, quite active in 1970s and already in 1970s they wanted to have a place to go to and commemorated the family members who were killed during the Holocaust. Uh, and they, had, they wanted a public place, as they explained uh, to me, because I, I uh, interviewed several of them. However, uh, they didn't get uh, 
any support for, for this initiative to, to build a Holocaust memorials in 1970s and not in 1980s either. However, situation changed in the middle of 1990s and it was connected to a Swedish men membership in European Union uh, because uh, uh, Sweden became a, a member in uh, 1995 and it was precisely at this time when European Union started to, to turn uh, Holocaust memory to a common memory for Europe, uh, together with a memory of Second World War. And of course we can discuss, and it is a separate, uh, separate uh, discussion, why, um, but what, what can be uh, said in this context is that in 1995, uh, and there are dissertations written already about this, the European Union uh, so uh, uh, treated the Holocaust memory as a tool to uh, fight uh, xenophobia, uh, nationalism, racism uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, and Sweden became a member, uh, and while until 1995, there was quite quite big disinterest in, in the history of, of, of the Holocaust in Sweden. Uh, suddenly, Swedish politicians started to play a, a first fiddle, I would say, in, in this, uh, this um, uh, European politics of memory. So, for example, uh, in, um, uh, they started this living uh, memory campaign, uh, producing books uh, about uh, Holocaust memory that were distributed to all families in Sweden and translated to, to several European languages. Uh, 2000 Sweden uh, uh, organized uh, this uh, quite famous uh, Swedish uh, uh, international uh, forum on Holocaust where uh, 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 high politicians and heads of governments from 45 countries met and declared that uh, 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 solemnly that they will work to keep the Holocaust memory uh, alive. Sweden was, was one of the initiators of this uh, international uh, task um, force on uh, Holocaust research, education and remembrance. So it was a huge engagement from the Swedish government and as my uh, um, interview, interview is, uh, said to me, they saw in 1995-1996 that it was a great occasion to uh, to approach Swedish government and get financial support for this memorial. So it could be realized, and in 1998, the fact that the Swedish king unveiled it, uh, it was uh, interpreted as, as a sign that it's not more uh, just Jewish memory, the survivors, but it's also Swedish national memory, as well as transnational European one. And interesting, uh, another aspect of this memorial from the transnational memory point of view is also that uh, they, uh, the initiators, uh, the committee of, uh, uh, that created the monument, the memorial, uh, consisting of, of, among others, uh, representative of this association of Holocaust survivors, they went to United States to look at the memorials, uh, in Holocaust memorials in United States, in order to get uh, to get ideas how to design the mon monuments. So um, it is actually inspired by the Holocaust memorial in Miami. It, it turned out, uh, which also uh, uh, points to this uh, transnational uh, elements. Another. Uh, the interesting thing is the inscriptions in, in, on the monument. There are several inscriptions, some of them of, of a religious kind, but the one uh, which I quote here is very specific because uh, it really uh, connects to these ideas uh, uh, of European uh, um, uh, memory of Holocaust. You, it uses as, as a tool because it says explicitly, only with knowledge about the past can we fight racism, anti-Semitism, and intolerance. So it's very much in line with 
uh, what both Swedish government and uh, uh, European politicians uh, argued for. So this is the one uh, example. Uh, let me go to the another one from, uh, from Sweden. Uh, and this is what you see here. It's the so-called Raoul Wallenberry Room uh, in the Army Museum in Stockholm, created in 2014. And it is actually a, a reconstruction of his uh, office um, in Budapest. I don't think I, I need to, to uh, speak to present Raoul Wallenberg uh, here because uh, you know his, his uh, engagement in saving Hungarian Jews by giving them this uh, Schutz passes, Swedish Schutz passes, so they could be treated as, as Swedish citizens and uh, saved, uh, saved uh, from the Nazis. Uh, as you know, uh, Raoul Wallenberg was arrested in 1945 uh, by uh, Soviet military and disappeared. And the, the interesting thing was that uh, many wanted to know uh, for years what happened to them. Uh, Simon Wiesenthal was actually one, one of, of uh, the persons who uh, wanted to investigate this. Uh, but in Sweden, uh, there was a very, uh, I would say, very calm attitude on the part of Swedish uh, uh, government to investigate it. It was because uh, it was the Cold War and Sweden wanted to, to be in a friendly uh, um, or at least a proper uh, uh, relations with the Soviet, Soviet Union, so uh, they uh, uh, they didn't want to touch upon the, upon the subject. So the paradoxical thing with, with Raoul Wallenberg was that he was commemorated uh, in many places uh, around uh, the world uh, before he started to be commemorated in, in Sweden. Uh, there were films made in the United States about him, there were monuments in, in different countries, especially in the in United States, but even in, in Budapest, even if there was controversy, controversy around it, but not uh, uh, until the 1990s, not, nothing uh, about this in, in Sweden. And again, this is interesting how it changed with the fall of, of the Berlin Wall and Swedish engagement in Holocaust memory in, in the 1990s. The first exhibition about uh, uh, Raoul Wallenberg uh, uh, ever in Sweden was created in 2004, and it was uh, uh, made in a Jewish Museum in Stockholm. Uh, first, uh, 10 years afterwards, it became a part of, of a, a nationally funded uh, uh, Swedish Museum, this Army Museum, where he is presented uh, uh, in this specific context like a war hero, because it's, it's, it's the Army Museum, so to say. So in a way, uh, he is now uh, uh, used as a kind of personalizing uh, the role of Sweden in the Second World War as a rescuer. Uh, confirming the narrative about uh, uh, Sw Swedish uh, role as rescuer, for example, from, for, of Danish Jews or, or uh, uh, big parts of Norwegian uh, Jews. At the same time, we, uh, there, there is, of course, this, this uh, doesn't uh, uh, touch upon the, the more difficult problem about the past uh, in, in Swedish context. Uh, uh, the, uh, a reason to discuss, for example, Swedish complicity uh, in the war because of, of a trading, uh, intensive trading with, with the Nazi Germany, and so on and so on. I leave these this questions aside. But uh, my point is here that actually uh, the uh, Wallenberg shows how the memory that was produced somewhere else outside uh, the Swedish nation come uh, uh, through transnational uh, uh, sharing of memory became also uh, 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 national uh, memory uh, in Sweden. So this is about Swedish examples. And now uh, I would like to speak about 
Now to something completely different <laughs> um, about Poland, and uh, it will be quite specific and different uh, case because uh, I spoke about capital city of, of uh, Stockholm in my uh, previous example, and here we go to a very small place, uh, to a town called Szydłowiec in central Poland, uh, which uh, uh, before the war, before the Holocaust, uh, had about uh, 11,000 inhabitants, and uh, about 17% of, of the inhabitants were uh, Jews, uh, who uh, majority of them, great majority of them, were killed in Treblinka. So you have this stony Treblinka with names of the, the places uh, from which uh, victims were taken to Treblinka. So you have this stone about Szydłowiec as well. And uh, I, uh, uh, in the beginning of 2000, I participated in a, a quite big uh, research project in Lund uh, about uh, Holocaust memory in Europe. And one of my colleagues sitting here, Frederick Lindstrom, was also a participant of this project. Uh, when we looked at how Holocaust is remembered in different countries. And among others, uh, other things, I, in, within this project, I uh, investigated this uh, small place, uh, looking for uh, how uh, the current population of this, this uh, town remembers uh, the uh, Jewish inhabitants, how they relate to the Jewish past, how they remember Holocaust. So it was a micro-study uh, with interviews, questionnaires, and so on and so on. And in general, uh, the, co the conclusions of, of the studies uh, in 2000-2005, when I ended this, was that it was uh, a place where, where the Jewish past was very much forgotten. Uh, so, uh, in, different, in different ways, the names, former Jewish names of streets were removed and changed. Uh, the uh, big uh, Jewish cemetery um, uh, in the middle of the city was neglected, as you see uh, the uh, pictures uh, from this time. Uh, but uh, even more, there was a lack of transmission of, of about, about what happened there before the war and during the war between the generations. So I had f focus groups with different generations and realized that uh, almost nothing was transmitted uh, uh, between those people who, who experienced Second World War in the city and those who came later or were born later. Uh, so many of people they even didn't know that that uh, the, the town was a typical shtetl, so to say, uh, be before uh, the war, and uh, the information about uh, the killing of, of uh, seventy percent of inhabitants uh, was not uh, was not there at all uh, in a local history. Um, uh, writing, uh, writings, they was mentioned, but uh, no, nothing about the numbers, just they were some Jews that lived here before the war, and then they were killed uh, uh, by Nazi Germans. It was all, uh, so th the information wasn't there, and there was just one monument uh, on, uh, to, to the victims of Holocaust from, from the city, but you, it, it looked like this and it was placed on this forgotten uh, cemetery, which I uh, showed before. Uh, and as I know, uh, got to know, it was built by, uh, by local uh, party committee uh, in 1967, uh, so it was not really grassroots initiative in any way, and it was quickly forgotten after 68, of course, where, where the memory of Jews in Poland was suppressed also very strongly from, from above. So it was the situation which I could present in 2005. But in a year ago, 2016, 2017, I decided to 
we turn to the city and look what happened uh, after this more than 10, 10 years had passed. And I wanted to do it because all of it in, uh, in the beginning of 2000, I saw being in, in the town that there are budding changes uh, going on. There were uh, some local initiative from sc local school teachers to uh, to dig in, in, in this uh, Jewish past of the town, to collect memorabilia, to collect uh, some memories for school children. And there were uh, some uh, um, signals also from, from the central level uh, from, from Warsaw that they, the, these local teachers could apply from some small money for project concerning, uh, <coughs> concerning uh, the Jewish past. So I wanted to go and see if something happened. And really, uh, it, uh, I could see quite, quite sig significant changes. Uh, I, uh, one obvious example of them is totally new monument to, uh, to these Holocaust victims in, in the Shtetl, uh, unveiled 2014 and uh, placed in, in, uh, in the middle of the city close to the uh, uh, upper secondary school, uh, where, which is built on the grounds of the synagogue that was uh, ruined during the Second World War. And so it, it's a, a very visible place uh, compared to this forgotten uh, cemetery uh, and, and so on. Uh, uh, so this, and this monument is used for, for small commemorations of, of the Jewish inhabitants. Uh, also, uh, uh, the uh, upkeep of cemetery changed totally. Now it's, they, it's regularly cleaned and uh, uh, taken uh, care for. Uh, there are also regular um, uh, projects, different kinds of, of cultural projects that are connected to, to Jewish memory. They, they celebrate, for example, in the town every year day of Jewish, a day of Jewish culture. And now you can, uh, in all informations about the town, it's very visible that it was previously a, a shtetl uh, in a local history writing, uh, but uh, there are special book produced about um, this, this past, and also you can find it on, on the web page, of, 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 uh, official web page of, of the town. So, so it is really big change, and one could ask, and I also, as I said, uh, I, again, I did questionnaires and, and focus groups uh, with people there, and it turned out that now it was quite obvious for them that it was a, a Jewish uh, town. Uh, every every uh, school, school child have some kind, some idea of this, not, not clear all of them, but, but still. So, uh, how come, what is the source of this information? How, how did it happen? Uh, and again, I could see that the, the, there is again a transnational memory workings behind this. And one, and I would say the main source of knowledge as it turned out in my investigation for, uh, about the Jewish past of this uh, former shtetl is actually Shidwowitz Memorial Book, also called Yisko Book. You know this, this kind of publications uh, produced by, by uh, the survivors of the communities, uh, Jewish communities in Eastern Europe that disappeared. Uh, books uh, containing uh, description of uh, la the, their lives before the war, but also their memories, uh, quite often memories from the Holocaust, sometimes even directly after. Uh, these Yisko books were produced usually in, in, uh, in about uh, maximum uh, thousand um, uh, uh, issues, thousand uh, X. Uh, and uh, they were tar tar they were the targeted uh, families of the survivors, families of, of these uh, um, uh, communities, their descendants. However, what happened here was that uh, this book was translated to English, and um, one of uh, one non-Jewish uh, 
uh, Polish immigrant to New York found this book uh, by chance in, in a, a shop uh, and uh, bought several uh, 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 several books at the same time, and because he knew about my my investigation in Szydłowiec, and he knew also about uh, the teacher I, I collaborated with, uh, he sent us these books. And uh, my my uh, uh, collaborator in Szydłowiec, she couldn't uh, uh, read English, so I summarized uh, big parts of. of uh, uh, the book to her and uh, uh, encourage her to to use book in some way or at least to get prof uh, some some uh, format translator to co collaborate with her to translate uh, at least parts of this book, and this actually happened and uh, uh, the the big parts of. Uh, uh, these books were translated and used in, in a, a publication that she did to, together with a professional historian about Szydłowiec. So now uh, the, this Polish uh, uh, book about Szydłowiec juice is on the net and you can see it. But this is interesting that um, the, this book uh, in a way uh, uh, was produced within a, a narrative for one community, but in traveling uh, across across the na uh, national border, across the languages, uh, across the nations, actually triggered memory uh, of an, of another community of this Polish community uh, in Szydłowiec. Uh, however, I would say I could say that it was interesting experience for me that there was a big enthusiasm about translating the whole book at the beginning, but it turned out that it would be very problematic because the book contains some parts where there are people, Polish Szydłowiec inhabitants that are described and named by name as those who denounced, uh, denounced Jews to the Germans or behaved indecently in, in different way, uh, uh, in other ways uh, towards the, the Swedish, the, the, the Jewish neighbors. So it, uh, my collaborators in, in Szydłowiec said to me that, you know, uh, we can't publish all because they, they, they will be very problematic both for us since we make these disclosures, but also for, for the descendants, families of these people who are not uh, alive anymore, but still now will be pointed out. So it, it's an example, I think, that uh, the difficult part of this past is still, uh, still problematic to, to approach. It's more uh, about recognition uh, of, of, of uh, the uh, uh, Jewish contributions to to the, to the town, uh, but not touching upon these more uh, more sensitive questions. I could add also that there is now an exhibition about history of the town in the local uh, uh, in the local uh, museum, and uh, the Jewish past is uh, uh, there. Uh, also exemplified by, by this memorabilia that local teachers collected. So uh, this, this is in this, kind, this example of how a mnemonic uh, uh, product like this book uh, uh, travels across uh, cultural and national borders. But what travels is of course not only products but also people. Uh, and uh, I would like to point out here the uh, importance of, uh, of uh, people as carriers of transnational memories. In this uh, Szydłowiec case, a kind of uh, carrier of, of uh, uh, this uh, transnational memory was this uh, Paul from New York who sent the book, the books. Partially, uh, uh, it, it was also my role to, 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 to participate in, in, in this uh, transfer, memory transfer. But uh, what I think it's most important to point out in, in the case of Szydłowiec, that they are actually Jewish people that are memory uh, uh, carriers, Jewish people in person. 
And this is interesting because many scholars who, who study uh, a kind of revival of the interest for Jewish culture in Poland today, they argue that it is uh, about virtual memory because there are not, not uh, many Jews in Poland that live in Poland today. Uh, so it's, it's argued that, that, that it is about, so to say, Polish play. Uh, but uh, it turns out, uh, and it is my, my um, I would like to argue that, that, uh, that the Jewish uh, uh, people play a role because it turns out that they visit these places like Szydłowiec quite frequently, uh, sometimes looking for the places where their ancestors lived, sometimes like this uh, uh, Israeli uh, youth come they on the during the, the uh, uh, regular pilgrimages to Holocaust places uh, in, in Poland. And actually, uh, they, uh, in their direct meetings with Polish inhabitants, uh, they make uh, the Poles to reconsider uh, things that they didn't think about before. For example, they start to, at, at least to some extent, to see the place through their gaze. And as in my interview, it was quite, quite uh, uh, visible that they told me, oh, we were ashamed of the state of the cemetery when these people come, and, and uh, we, we can't show them anything. So, so uh, I think we shouldn't, shouldn't underestimate this, this uh, personal uh, uh, engagement. Uh, and I also uh, um, found uh, out that uh, in this building of, of this monument, uh, new monument of the Holocaust victims, there were two uh, Jewish organizations involved, uh, uh, one called uh, uh, Israeli uh, uh, Israeli-Polish uh, association from Tel Aviv and uh, one Belgian-French uh, organization that called uh, uh, Jewish organization that called themselves uh, the F Friends of Szydłowiec because they, they had roots in, in this city. And they approached the major that a new monument should be built and then uh, the process uh, started. Uh, moreover, I, find, I found out that there are several Jewish foundations that are involved in this uh, revival of, of um, local memory uh, because uh, uh, local teachers could apply, for example, uh, for some money um, uh, for project, cultural project uh, to Shalom Foundation, to Taube Foundation, to Nissenbaum Foundation, and so on. So, so here it's obviously <coughs> that the, uh, the Jewish interest for this memory is also there and influences the local people. And uh, one example that I want to end with is precisely to show uh, 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 pictures from this Israeli Pol Polish youth meetings that are organized in the city uh, now since uh, four, five, four or five years. Uh, and <clears throat> this is a cooperation between local school teachers and uh, pupils from the local school from Szydłowiec with a school in Israel <clears throat> that uh, take their students to, to Poland every year and among other places they visit, they come to Szydłowiec and they commemorate uh, the Holocaust victims together with Polish youth. So it's both Israeli and uh, Polish uh, uh, youngsters meet. Uh, they make a, the, a march through, through the town. And then they, on, on the cemetery, they have a, a very, I would say, hybrid uh, ceremony because they both uh, um, put uh, lights and flowers, like in the Catholic uh, tradition, but they also put stones and uh, and um, uh, pray Kaddish together and sing songs together at this place and so on. And in my interviews with, with pupils, uh, um, uh, it, it turned out that it was quite, uh, quite um, 
big, big impression this experience uh, made on, on them. In a way, um, I, would, uh, I would argue that they started to to see that this um, memory uh, is uh, not only Jewish memory, but also their own, their local Polish memory. So it, it's why I think uh, what was created in, in, this, um, in these meetings is kind of, uh, I call, transcultural space, uh, where, uh, where you can remember together, together in, in hybrid way, which allows uh, to, to enable to imagine uh, new types of, of identification and new types of belonging. And that is why I want to make this distinction between, uh, I would say, just transnational and transcultural memories, because my idea is that transcultural is uh, first and foremost about the crossing national borders, but transcultural, it's start to take its one step further to think in terms of hybridization, in terms of multiple belongings, like making this, this uh, Szydłowiec uh, Jewish heritage as both Jewish and, and Polish local heritage at the same time. So I would uh, like to, to end with this, uh, just hoping that that we would like to, to probably to create more of these transcultural uh, spaces uh, and experiences, not maybe just in connection to, to the Jewish memory, but much, much more general terms. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the demonstration will uh, will uh, uh, open later, so we have still time to discuss uh, your presentation. So, comments and questions are welcome. Bela? Uh, just my question goes, um, which I don't understand or didn't understand, is where is this transcultural memory which comes up in the I don't know, 2000s, um, and just showed us pictures from earlier. Where was this memory? Where was it hidden? Where, why did it come up? What's the, kind of the, the motivation that it comes up? You mean in Polish case? In Polish case, in, as I told, in 2000, uh, when I made my first uh, field study there, they, I couldn't see any transnational memory. Maybe except myself coming from outside and starting to discuss this with people in my interview, uh, in my interviews. So it was a kind of inception of first thinking, okay, if someone is interested and why and so on. At this time I also could see that um, uh, when I met these few teachers that were interested in, in uh, doing something with this past, um, I could see that I could a uh, little bit empower them in this, uh, because uh, when they uh, saw my interest, they took me to, to the major, they took me to people of importance in the town and uh, presented me. So they, they wanted in this way to, to, to get a kind of authority to continue with, with the initiatives, to, to, to do this project, like for example, uh, at this time in 2000, uh, they sent out uh, they, they children, school children, to interview their the grandfathers, grandmothers, what they remember from the Second World War in the town, what happened, and so on. And, she, and then they, they, it was, of course, uh, not proper historical uh, investigation, but it was a kind of, of engaging these this, this, uh, students in... in in something they didn't know anything about. So, so I just say that at this time, uh, I, I would say that I could, uh, this transnational element uh, was, was not much there. Uh, but, but when I came back in uh, 2017, uh, it actually was there, uh, because as, as, I, as I show through the book, through the contacts, intensified, very much intensified contacts with, with Jewish uh, visitors that started to come there in, in uh, much bigger numbers than, than before. 
uh, and Jewish foundations, engagement, and so on, and so on. Thank you very much for your lecture. Um, in fact, when I read your title, I was asking myself honestly, what could be the lines of comparison between Sweden and Poland? And amazingly, you m made it clear that there are lines of comparison. What I find interesting, if I understood you correctly, that actually all the memorials you presented us with here were initiated by victims and not by state, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's the first thing. The second thing is I'm lacking a little bit of context. Um, regarding the Swedish memorial, um, where is it placed actually? Is it placed on the wall of a house? And if so, which kind of house is this? Mm -hmm. Um, regarding the, the, the Shidlovitz uh, example, the Yusko book, you said it was translated into English. Uh, from which language was it, was it translated? And finally, the memorial, the new memorial, uh, where you couldn't see the text actually on, on your picture, uh, in, which languages, in which language your language is, uh, is the text written? Thank you. Uh, maybe I start from the back. Uh, on, uh, I'm sorry, it was not the best, best picture. And it's because the, the stone is so white, it's difficult. But it's both in Polish and English, uh, the inscription. And it, uh, it tells very simply that it commemorates uh, the Jewish um, inhabitants of Szydłowiec and surroundings killed in, uh, n Nazi, by Nazi Germans. It's formulated in... in no, no, it's it's English and Polish. Yes, uh, although in in in, in uh, uh, when they, it was unveiled, they were representatives of both this Jewish uh, organization I mentioned, by all, but also uh, the official representative of Rabbi from Warsaw. So it was. Uh, and local church as well, and, and so on and so on. So they tried to make it to, 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 to common commemoration. So it's about, about uh, them. Uh, about Yisko book. Actually, I, I want to know this as well, but it's, I have the book. It's not, nothing is said there. I guess it's, it's Yiddish, but I don't know. I don't really know. I, uh, so probably I would need to find... Uh, somewhere to, 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 to tra trace some person which is writing in, in the book, but I, I'm, I didn't do, do it. Uh, and as to, to the Swedish monument, uh, it, is, uh, it starts at the walls of the uh, main synagogue in Stockholm. So it's uh, precisely uh, it's the entrance to the synagogue, and so the, this long wall uh, starts. And then it's, it's really not very visible because it's a very small alley, uh, but it's quite significant alley because it's called Aaron uh, Isaac Alley. And uh, historically, it's, it's said that it was um, the name of the first um, uh, Jew who were allowed, allowed to, to practice uh, his religion in Sweden. Uh, and it was as late as, as uh, in the in 18th century. So, so it's, so, and, and it is interesting because then, which I didn't set because of the lack of time, the Ali is, uh, after they built the monument, they got a, um, stones from Budapest and paved the Ali with these stones uh, uh, from Budapest, and when the alley ends, there is a square where they built a small, uh, it's called Wallenberg uh, Monument, but it's quite abstract. It's, it's uh, how to say, uh, a snow silk, a clout. Um, a, a clout, a globe, globe. <laughs> globe with a lot of inscriptions in different languages and, and so on. But it's called Wallenberry Square and therefore they say that it's Wallenberry Monument as well. There are others now as well. But, but it's, it's, so it's quite a special place, I would say. Uh, but not, not hugely visible because it's really there in, in this alley. Mm-hmm. 
mm -hmm. that it's actually on the wall of the synagogue. So it's, it's basically a Jewish space also. Mm -hmm. It's in the outside. It's interesting, yeah. But it's interesting that uh, when I spoke with, with uh, members of this committee uh, that initiated the monument, they told me that they wanted to have it so. Uh, and even they told me that there was some controversy between uh, them, them and uh, the authorities, religious authorities of, of the synagogue that were not happy about it. Uh, but but they wanted to, to have it so, and they said, they didn't use religious argument when they spoke with me, but they said that uh, it is a place uh, where uh, um, many uh, people who are interested in, in uh, Jewish culture in, in come, actually. So it's, it's a public place where people can, can uh, come anyway when they are interested uh, in the, Jew of the Jewish past in, in uh, Sweden. And uh, uh, also, they, they said to me that uh, uh, because the, it's, it's a part of religious classes in, in many uh, Swedish schools, that they come and visit mosques, synagogue, and different churches, so they will always come there as well. Uh, so it was their argument to say that we wanted to have it there and had to fight to have it there. What was the language the Jewish community spoke in this Polish town? Uh, it was mostly Yiddish. Mm. But then I would challenge what you said about transcultural memory, because mm. then when the monument is in English and in Polish, then, I mean, what's the transculturality? Then I take away again the language. I mean, when I mem commemorate them, it should be in Yiddish too. What, I mean, where is the transculturality then? Uh, I mean, I think it's interesting even that here the, the uh, associations that were involved in the, in, to initiate the monument, uh, this Polish, uh, um, uh, this, this Jewish uh, uh, organization from Tel Aviv and from uh, Belgium and, and, and France, they could propose this, but they didn't. But, but but I mean I mean uh, uh, I don't think I don't think it will uh, uh, you uh, I think that it it's uh, if you think that this this book Shudwavi uh, Cisco book uh, as I know I, I I know it's just it exists in English it is why did they do it in English because they wanted to, to they descendants that not that cannot uh, read uh, uh, Yiddish. To, to know, to get this information. So if you, if you think, of course, ideally you could say that you would like to have in Yiddish, English, and, and Polish. Uh, but if you think in terms of to be communicative to everybody, you can say that English is it's a compromise. I think the language. So we have uh, Alicia was first. Um, I don't think we can talk about a revival of memory in Shudwowiec. I think, unfortunately, it is an artificial construction to the point of being falsified if Polish crimes against Jews are not confronted in any way within the community. And so what you presented might seem optimistic because there is more memory, uh, but I remain doubtful if it's actually serves the purpose that the European Union envisioned, fighting nationalism. I think in Poland, right now, it might be the opposite. So I would be interested in your opinion. Mm. Um, I think, it's, but it's my personal opinion, that you have to start somewhere when you work with, with memories that are, have been suppressed or marginalized and so on. And as I have seen it to develop during these 10 years, as I said, so I think it's, it's, uh, it is a step forward because what I could see is in, in 2000 there was an unwillingness very much on, on, uh, people, uh, on the part of local people to speak about this past or, or no information at all, suppressed and so on. But now I think very much due to this personal uh, 
contacts with Jewish visitors, uh, but not only, uh, this otherness of the other that I could see in, in, in 2000 is to some extent dismantled. There is no a kind of anxiety which I could see in, in 2000. For example, when I uh, visited uh, form, uh, uh, the former homes of Jewish people that are now inhabited by, by Poles in, in, in this town, when I wanted to interview them and speak with them, the first reaction was very often, oh, I can show you my papers that I own this house. So it was a clear uh, voice that, uh, and it was expressed also in local um, newspaper at this time, that Jews will come back to take uh, their homes back from, from the Poles. And I have to say that now, when, when I came 10 years earlier, it's much, much less of it. Even I have seen that uh, younger people actually scorn uh, those, uh, when in, in the local newspapers, scorn these old people who, who come with, uh, with this kind of claims, are uh, just are coming back to take our homes. No, it's, it's quite, they laugh at this kind of, of, of uh, discourse. Uh, so I think, uh, and, and also I mean the, the friendly, uh, open attitude which is now shown to 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 to, to uh, Jewish as it, uh, visitors. I would say it's it's a it's a huge step uh, forward. Of course, I would ideally want also that that the next step will be this this uh, to take to, to to deal with this difficult part which I mentioned. Uh, and it's not still there, uh, and of course uh, uh, the current politics of, of, of uh, uh, Polish government, this with new memory laws, uh, will not encourage it, I would say, so it's, it's, it's uh, a problem. But, uh, but I hope that, that these steps will not, uh, will, that will not go back so much that, 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 that this development will not be possible in the future. Uh, and I appreciate personally very much this local ac memory activists, as I call them, that, that really made this breakthrough. And they still, they are very upset what, uh, what happens in Poland now, and they are still, still very much engaged in these processes. Um. Anyhow, I have to take you back a step and coming back to the languages and to this memorial. Um, it's, I'm very surprised, uh, so I'm not surprised that it's only in uh, English and in Polish because this is a clear statement. So you're taking away the Yiddish card from the monument. So once you have a, you don't have to have a Yiddish inscription, but usually nowadays in mo most places you will have at least a, a Hebrew inscription, or maybe the same text, maybe in translation, or maybe something something else. But so a whole monument without a transcription in in Hebrew, it's very unusual. That, and then it could always be so. Even so, there are two ways. Once the Jewish organizations they wanted to have it, and the local authorities said no way. Or the other way, the Jewish organizations knew already if they would ask for it and they won't get the uh, monument. Mm -hmm. that, that could be work in both ways. But I would like to go back to the Swedish uh, memorial as well and ask for the languages there. What kind of, in what kind of languages the inscriptions is and if the text in the different languages is the same or if the text differs. Uh, there is no Hebrew there, it's uh, Swedish and English, uh, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's the same, uh, the same in Swedish and the same in English. It's what I can say. But I mean, in, uh, yeah. in the case of Sweden, maybe, uh, of course, uh, the survivors that initiated, they, they, they probably were uh, very much in, in, in uh, Yiddish culture as well, because most of them uh, came from Eastern Europe. But but um, uh, I think uh, Swedish Jews uh, are, uh, though are from from 
those who came a long time before the Second World War, they, they, they don't probably connect to this Yiddish culture and so on so much. They also told me, this, this members of this committee, that there, there was a kind of struggle with, uh, with as they, call, they called them uh, to me, Swedish Jews and we Jews from Eastern Europe. So there is, uh, within community in, in Stockholm, there is some kind of, of gap as well, but uh, I didn't dig in, in, in this more than that. The last question Fred, from Fredrik, or comment. <clears throat> I wanted to return to the Swedish case, and I have a question asking for your opinion of, this is not immediately had to do with the transcultural memory, but it has to do something with the kind of private character of the Holocaust Memorial in Stockholm noted earlier, and the falsification of memory uh, noted also. Um, the Swedish government, as you said initially, was very strong on Holocaust memory in the 90s and this big conference in 2000, and they're going to have another one in 2020, yep. I've recently learned. So the Swedish government is really working on, on this, and this is an important part of it. Um, uh, on the other hand, they have, they have, have these books distributed to school children and to all the households in, in all of Sweden around that time too. And then the question is, what did this campaign do? And in my hometown, Malmö, a few years ago, 2009 to 2012, there was a, a kind of anti-Semitic campaign conducted by the mayor. And it created a very uneasy atmosphere in Malmö. Many Ma Jews of Malmö uh, considered leaving. Uh, Barack Obama twice sent a special representative to Malmö to check what is happening here. So it was quite internationally noted. And uh, this mayor resigned in 2013, I think, and it, but it remained kind of mm -hmm. uh, uneasy situation in the following years. And in 2015, the Jewish community in, in Sweden had an, some kind of arrangements called Jewish Spring, and this time it was going to be in Malmö. Uh, and for this um, event, uh, the American composer Steve Reich was uh, invited. And he was interviewed in Stockholm before going to Malmö and declared that he was a bit apprehensive about going to this place, which he had heard was, was strongly anti-Semitic. Uh, and when he came there and had a concert and a talk, during the talk, a young man uh, stood up, raised his hand in a Hitler greeting and said, Heil Reich, mm. loudly, twice. And later that year, there was kind of a different connected uh, event. There was a Malmö documentary filmer called Frederick Gerten made a film called Harbor of Hope about the Jewish mm -hmm. refugees and all the refugees from Nazi Germany in 1945. And uh, uh, in the fall of 2015, this was connected to the refugee crisis mm -hmm. and the refugees coming into Malmö. And I found that both in the film and in the kind of presentation of it and discussion of it, there was a very self-congratulatory tone that Sweden was, the Swedes had been very good uh, in 45 and now they were doing it again, kind of. Interesting, Frederick Gerten was in Israel to present his film and there he met a lot of critical questions about what was happening at, Ma at Malmö at the present. Uh, a long time after uh, these events of 45. And, um, my question here is a bit, this kind of strong anti-Semitic upheaval in, in Malmö in just the last couple of years, uh, is, it was kind of mainly denied, I, I think. The Prime Minister, t Swedish Prime Minister of the same party as the mayor, a social democrat, in the end had to put down his foot and say stop, just stop. But the social democratic kind of ideologues and journalists defended him with kind of argument that even if it sounded anti-Semitic and everyone outside Sweden perceived it as anti-Semitic, it couldn't be because we don't have anti-Semitism in Sweden, at least not in the Social Democratic Party. Uh, so, um, and just a few years later, I was appalled to see that this mayor was, appoint was uh, awarded an honorary doctorate at Malmö University. Uh, I was just kind of thinking about this 
when you you were quite brief on the Swedish case, but mm -hmm. with this kind of very strong Swedish government initiative in in furthering Holocaust mm -hmm. memory, and what is what happened in in uh, the last few years in in Malmo, I feel a strong kind of tension, and, and mm -hmm. wonder a bit on, on your opinion about mm -hmm. that. Thank you for big question. <laughs> I, so I try to be short. I, I would say first and foremost that uh, I agree with you about this self-congratulatory tendency in Sweden uh, very much. It's uh, not just about Holocaust memory, but very much about an image of a very uh, friendly, open, tolerant, democratic society and so on, which, which is to some extent, it's it's true, but but sometimes you feel that it's exaggerated. In the case of this, I think this the problem in Sweden, in Malmo specifically, as you know perfectly because you lived there for for many years, that Malmo became a very multicultural city, and. The conflicts uh, with a lot of, of uh, cultural and uh, ethnic conflicts uh, between different groups, and uh, one is uh, between uh, people uh, uh, of, mass, uh, of Muslim religion uh, and uh, the uh, Jewish uh, people, because it's a kind of political conflict which is imported from the Middle East uh, to Malmo. Uh, and I think it, it is why it's so difficult for uh, Swedish politicians to deal with it. Because you, uh, firstly, uh, I think since Sweden was homogeneous for a long time, or now almost, uh, so they, they are really not accustomed to, uh, to deal with multi-ethnic conflicts. And they want to be good to everybody and don't want to defend both groups. So, the, so actually, I, I, I think there is a kind of paralysis in, in a social democracy here. How to handle this, 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 these things? So, so it's it's <laughs> it's one one. Uh, uh, because of course uh, there is also there are also group like like skinheads and this kind of nationalist white power and uh, this kind of antisemitism can also appear, but a strange thing is that if you look at, at um, the uh, official rightist party in in Poland uh, like Sweden Democrats, uh, they are. Uh, actually not anti-Semitic and even they, they, they have quite a lot of members that are of Jewish uh, origin and uh, uh, not only origin but will declare this, uh, this kind of identity. So I think as, as to the Swedish right, I wouldn't say that uh, except of course most extreme extremists uh, like, like this, this, uh, um, uh, this, this white power things. Uh, so I wouldn't say see much uh, anti-Semitism there, but but there is uh, a conflict. Uh, and uh, when I speak with with, uh, uh, for example, uh, um, my Jewish colleague or, or friends in Lund, they mostly speak about to me about this aspect with with uh, the conflict with, with the Islamic minorities. I just want to say that I think that is partly uh, um, uh, to explain it all away because the mayor of Malmo was no Muslim and um, uh, he had uh, very many defenders within social democracy and I don't think uh, we should see that as kind of use the Muslim minority in Malmo to explain this thing wholly. This was something that was driven from the highest position in in Malmö and from a social democratic politician who was defended by his kins uh, at the same time as it was criticized for anti-Semitism both internationally and by the Jewish community in Sweden. So I think that that's a usual way of explaining it but I don't think it, it covers the, the problem really. And I think this kind of thing, offering him, a, uh, awarding him an honorary doctorate is uh, part of the kind of non-understanding that is kind of um, prevalent. I, I think there, there are divided opinions on this, what let us say. <laughs> so, just a very, very last question. This is also a common memory politics in both 
a part of Europe. Europe like uh, the northern part, the Sweden, and the eastern part like Poland, that uh, as uh, Frederick and you mentioned, uh, politicians uh, or in the very high level can mobilize uh, such uh, emotions uh, to to uh, so, and and then uh, and then the, the commemoration is a kind of alibi uh, of uh, of a, uh, a collective identity. And your f first hypothesis was that memory politics is all, uh, uh, very important to. To understand for us social scientists, because uh, memory, politi um, memory politics uh, is always connected with uh, a collective identity. And now I ask myself whether we can still discuss on community co 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 collective identity, or it is a poor history politics which we cannot uh, touch, which we cannot use as a, uh, uh, for formation for collective identity because it's fully uh, mediatized, uh, um, stereotypes and so on. Uh, and even uh, uh, you and me and uh, the social historians or social scientists who want to understand it cannot understand it because we are also in the framework of the, this memory politics or history politics. Mm. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, when you speak about about politicians and what they do and why, what are the motives and so on, you can contextualize this for different, uh, different situations. Like, for example, let us say in Sweden, uh, uh, there was, uh, I could, I could uh, argue that uh, what uh, Swedish uh, uh, prime minister did uh, when, when they he started to be engaged. Uh, uh, he may be really, I don't know about his personal motives, maybe he, is, he was authentically engaged in this, but of course it was a kind of way for Sweden to position uh, the, itself uh, as a new member uh, in the European Union. And since, since, uh, since Sweden has uh, produced a self-image of uh, being engaged uh, in, in um, uh, as a kind of moral power, as, be, as being in, engaged in keep uh, uh, peacekeeping uh, operations, in, in um, uh, also uh, fighting against uh, tolerance, building welcoming towards refugees, and so on. So, of course, it was uh, uh, to, to be engaged in memorial forecast in time when the European Union was also interested in this. It played well for both parts. So you can, of course, uh, interpret this in this way. However, again, uh, I think that sometimes uh, we should be, of course, always always critical to this kind of, of games that politicians are playing on all levels. Uh, but I think we shouldn't uh, underestimate always w which kind of effects can uh, have on on people on the ground be because and sometimes they are positive effects, sometimes negative. But but I would I would like to say that, for example, in uh, even in Swedish case, uh, uh, you can't um, uh, not appreciate the fact that uh, that now uh, Holocaust is. Uh, uh, an uh, uh, obligatorium in Swedish curri curriculum uh, and that uh, every Swedish child in one of another knows about this memory, even if you can question the motives why it happened and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, so uh, I, I think that uh, we, should be, we should take case for case and, and mm -hmm. see what actually happens on all mm -hmm. levels. Okay. Thank you very much for this very interesting discussion and presentation, and thank you so much for the questions and comments. Uh, we will have a, a, the last. I will. I will turn switch into German. So, the 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 last Vorlesung werden wir am 24. Mai uh, haben. Unser Gast wird uh, Caroline Dean from uh, the Yale Uni uh, Universität. And the title of the presentation is The Making of the Survivor Witness, Revisiting the Eichmann Trial. Uh, and we have noch auch also viele weitere Programme, die ich uh, jetzt nicht uh, uh, alle vorlesen möchte. Aber ich möchte noch Sie darauf uh, aufmerksam machen, dass wir am 25. April, also bald, 
um 5 Uhr ein ähm, äh, 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 ein Kolloquium haben werden, Alicia äh, Podbieska wird uns über die Memory of Rescue in Poland einen Vortrag, einen Vortrag halten und wir werden an der Uni Wien ähm, äh, und dann noch letztendlich möchte ich noch äh, äh, Fernando Rosas äh, bewerben äh, es wird auch eine Vorlesung bei uns im Institut am 5. Mai es ist ein Samstag 6 Uhr äh, über die Forced Labor of Portuguese Citizens in the Third Reich wir haben noch viele andere Programme, die, die Programmhefte sind da draußen, also Sie sind herzlich willkommen an alle Veranstaltungen des, des VWIs und einen schönen Abend noch. Danke.